commercial free Catholic charismatic channel. He's strengthening the faith of so many people. To promote the gift of church teaching, dedicated for the new evangelization. God's blessings on your work, may God bless and prosper you. Shalom World, God's own channel. Who I am, what is the purpose of life? Original documentary series, La Vida. This series will help us understand the value and sanctity of life and how we can attain true freedom. When you are free of guilt, it is truly the most spectacular freedom you can ever have. Who determines quality of life? What is, what is the criteria for that? Every life is precious. The voice of your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. What have you done to protect the life of your brothers and sisters? The present day threats to human life can be in three categories. Those that prevent life, those that destroy life, and those that corrupt life. Of course, those that prevent life would be things like homosexual activity or contraception. Those that destroy life would be abortion before birth, and after birth, of course, it would be murder, genocide, it would be the death penalty, uh, it would be euthanasia, physician-assisted suicide, and things like this. But what people tend to lose track of is a third category, which is those things that uh, corrupt human life. And this can also be homosexuality, this can be new age practices, this can be pornography, things like this. In the beginning, God created the earth, the sun, moon, and stars in the sky, all kinds of plants and animals on the land, every kind of living being in the waters, and different kinds of birds in the air. And finally, God made the finest of his creation, man. But did God really create death for us? Absolutely not. It is the devil's envy that brought death into this world. So the devil has a galaxy of different distractions he throws in front of us. And he's always knocking on the door to our soul saying, just try this little bit of drugs or you can go ahead and have sex with this lady even though you're married, just do it one or two times, you know? A little bit of adultery is not gonna hurt anybody. Or you can go ahead and try this alcohol, go get drunk every once in a while. The devil is always knocking on our hearts and if we open that door just a little bit and let the devil in, then we've lost. We have to resist completely, remain pure, and say no to every kind of sin. As Saint Maria Goretti said, I would rather die than offend God. And truly, if you look at things from an eternal perspective, if you look at things throughout eternity, that really is a very wise thing of this beautiful young 13-year-old lady to say, that I would rather die and be in heaven than offend God and brisk going to hell. When our first parents, Adam and Eve, committed the sin of disobedience, death paved its way through Cain murdering his own brother, Abel. And you can still hear the word of God deep in your heart. The voice of your brother's blood cries to me from the ground. What have you done to protect the life of your brothers and sisters? I mean, there are many threats that are affecting life and family. And so again, we look at, you know, life is, people. some people today in the modern world in the secular culture, look at life as a commodity. I remember, you know, I think it was either Newsweek magazine, and I forget what year it came out. It showed a picture of a baby on the front cover with a barcode. A barcode is something we see on, on products. We go to the grocery store and they scan the barcode. They had a baby with a barcode on his forehead. 
because this is how people look at a child. It's a commodity. I can choose to have it, not to have it. And so instead of looking at life as precious and beautiful and awesome and, 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 and sacred, we look at it as, 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 a, as, as usury, a utilitarian approach. So the big challenge today is to break through that and not to look at life in that, in that way. And it should never be looked that way. I mean, if we look at utilitarianism and we look at this with our elderly, you know, a person reaches a certain age and they, and they can't take care of themselves anymore. Some members in society say, well, let's put that person to death. There's nothing more they can give. They, they're taking more than they're giving. You know, they, they've lost their right to life. Well, that's not true at all. Dignity doesn't have an end. You know, and a person's right to be treated with dignity doesn't end because they get old or they're too young or they're poor or they're rich. That dignity is inalienable, inviolable, as I said earlier. No one has the right to disregard. So our job is to uphold that, to defend it and to protect it. In the modern world, human life is threatened in several ways. Prenatal diagnosis is one of them. As we know, through prenatal diagnosis, the doctor determines before birth if the fetus has a problem. Prenatal diagnosis comes in several forms. Amniocentesis, which is withdrawing some of the amniotic fluid to see that the shed cells of the baby, whether or not they are perfect and from a health viewpoint. There are several other types of prenatal diagnosis. Unfortunately, the vast majority of prenatal diagnosis in the United States and in other developed countries is to target a child for extermination by abortion if they're not perfect. And this especially applies to cases of Down syndrome, where 90 to 95% of the babies who are diagnosed are aborted. The cry of the innocent blood reaches the very heart of the Almighty God. We don't have any right to take life whether sick or handicapped. We don't have the ability to give life, and so we have no right to take any life. But there are licit uses of prenatal uh, diagnoses, and these include preparing the husband and the wife and the physicians for a difficult delivery. So in Front Royal, where we come from, where everyone on the Catholic side of this culture here uh, do follow the teachings of the Catholic Church. There are only prenatal diagnosis when there seems to be a problem that can cause the physicians to be able to prepare themselves to deal with a baby that might have a difficult birth. Because every child, no matter how, di no matter how direly that they are handicapped, even if they only live for about two hours like one of my grandchildren did, deserve the love of their parents. That's all my little granddaughter experienced during her short two-day, uh, two-hour life was the love of her mother and her father and her grandparents and her sisters and brothers. So this is the way God designed us to be able to take care of little ones who will live for only a short time rather than killing them with the sharp knives of the abortionist. It's time to remember the story of Babel that spewed discord and scattered the human race. How are we going to use the modern facilities of the world? Are we going to produce life just like in a factory? Many people come with many questions. So we have couples who are struggling to have children and for some reason can't conceive. We have, you know, uh, uh, children who have elderly parents who become very dependent. And you know, so you, so the questions of what can I do to, you know, for example, with regard to, you know, encouraging life to, uh, in, in, in my marriage. In other words, if a couple is struggling and to, to have children, what can they do? What, what, what's within the church's teaching? And so, but you see the other side of the equation trying to promote, you know, things that don't promote the sanctity of matrimony. They're trying to remove you know, the, the, the beauty of the, of the unitive and procreative dimension from each other, separating these two realities. And so almost in a sense, looking at, you know, the, 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 uh, 
Life is something that is more biological, you know, and so they, for example, like with in vitro fertilization, some people say, well, look, aren't we helping people to have, have, have children? Why are we against in vitro fertilization? Because it distorts the beauty and sanctity of the marital act. It removes it from its natural environment of the conjugal intimate love, and it puts it into a sterile artificial environment. This is not of God's design. This is not what you know what God would uh, wants for that beautiful life of, of the intimacy and the conjugal uh, unitive dimension of marriage. And so the idea here is that we're distorting these realities. We are allowing brutal killing of the weak and disabled lives. We are indeed adopting a Spartan culture where only the best is allowed to survive. And we go to the other book in where we see people, you know, thinking, you know, that, you know, their life is meaningless now. There's nothing else to live for. Or their children make them think that they're burdensome because now they need to be cared for. You know, and so people consider euthanasia as something, well, I can, what, what's wrong with that? I mean, I've lived my life and, you know, or I'm dealing with cancer or I'm dealing with a disease and I'm no longer able to do what I once used to be able to do. And so the meaning and purpose of my life is, is no longer the same. Well, who told you the definition changed? Yes, your life is different. Yes, like the couple who struggles to have children, but it doesn't give me the right to distort, you know, what God has planned both for the, the, the author of life, because God is the author of life. God is the giver of life, not the couple. They cooperate with God. They collaborate with God. God is the author of life. And so he determines how this beautiful life will come into be, not to be created in a, in a petri dish or in some artificial environment, or to the elderly or the sickly who think that their life is meaningless because they're ill or they're dying, but that suffering is beautiful and God gives us the grace to, to live that suffering and to look through that suffering and to unite our suffering to His. So we need to look at these realities. And you know, again, because we have so created the man and woman in a secular definition, we again treat our biology as purely as a biological function. We look at life purely from a pragmatic perspective. And so we fail to see the sacredness, the sanctity, the beauty, the wonder, the awe of life. During the Industrial Revolution, people ventured to use more pesticides in farming. Sophisticated reproductive techniques were adopted for better breeds of plants and animals. But the end result? The surge of malignant diseases such as cancer carving into modern world. When we move away from natural ways that's according to God's plan of creation, we get trapped in the coils of consequences that lead to death that's more than just a physical term, leads us to eternal death. We look at children as a commodity. I can have or not have. Or I think that I have a right to a child. Or you look at the, the, the issues of, of same-sex attraction today and, and same-sex unions today, and people who are either two women or two men think they have a right to a child so they can have children created in, in through, through artificial insemination or, self, uh, or, or donation of seed and egg, or they can have a surrogate uh, uh, mother carry a child for them. It, it's unbelievable what we see today. But these are a, a perversions of God's great plan. And it's unbelievable that, you know, that there sadly are so many promoting these things. But it all comes down to a distorted view of the human person, a distorted understanding of who I am and my purpose of life and the meaning of my life. And, and so that's what we have to keep talking about. Most often, people go for prenatal diagnosis assuming that they are doing the right thing. So what do you think? As Christians, what should be our take on prenatal diagnosis? Artificial reproduction is a very wide field. There are some good technologies and there are some that are not so good, which include uh, artificial insemination uh, by a donor or AID and in vitro fertilization or IVF. What these do is they violate the sanctity of the marital bond. 
We have sex without babies, contraception, and we have babies without sex in certain methods of artificial reproductive technologies or assisted reproductive technologies. The way we can tell if they're licit is if they are in union with the husband and wife. The sperm has to come from the husband and uh, the egg has to come from the wife. It has to take place, the union of the egg and the sperm have to take place inside the mother's body. And also the sperm has to come from the husband. This is all laid out in questions on bioethics from the Vatican. Now, as some people say that isn't it pro-life to generate as many babies as possible? Well, this is kind of missing the point. The point is that a child has their own inherent dignity. They are not an object that can be created for the satisfaction or the fulfillment of the parents. Every child deserves their natural mother and their natural father. The most effective way to cure infertility that we have found so far is NAPRO technology or natural procreative technology founded by Dr. Thomas Hilgers in Nebraska. And what they do is they chart the cycle of the women so that the marital act can take place on those days of maximum fertility. And it is found to have an effectiveness rate that is twice as high as IVF. It is also a very natural way of solving the problem of infertility. So anybody who is suffering from this terrible cross should go the natural way because it is the more effective than any of the other types of assisted reproduction. Man was made in the image and likeness of God. Every individual has an inherent and immeasurable worth and dignity. Each human life is considered sacred. Who determines quality of life? What is, what is the criteria for that? Who determines I'm a one or you're a two or a three, and if I happen to be a 10, well, my life is over. We have to challenge those realities and not allow them to become so entrenched in the culture as they are becoming. We must intervene in this conversation. And so we need to help young, young couples or couples who are struggling with fertility issues and guide them in healthy, moral, appropriate ways. We need to help families who are dealing with handicapped or emotionally difficult situations or dealing with elderly or sickly parents. What are we doing to help? You know, so again, it goes back. To what am I doing? What am I doing about it? So that's a question again that you and I have to answer. St. Pope John Paul II in the Evangelium Vitae proclaims the inalienable dignity of human life. So when you look at life, and, and you look at its, its beauty, what's important for us to see is, again, what John Paul talked about in the very beginning of Evangelium Vitae. We have to reteach people how to love life. So we're talking about life in its totality, from conception until natural death, that every aspect, every part of the journey is to be loved, that we are to help people to love life respect life. So we teach people that every life is precious, that every life has an alienable dignity. My government doesn't give me that dignity. The political ideologies do not give me that dignity. That dignity is inalienable and inviolable. No one has the right to disrespect that dignity. We have a great responsibility to our brothers and sisters and our own life. By protecting and nurturing life, we are indeed taking steps to building an authentic civilization of truth and love. And so life is precious, not because someone else determines that my life is precious. My life is precious because it is precious. My life is a gift because it is a gift and I respond from that gift, and I'm, it demands that others respect that gift. No one can take away that gift. You know, my life is my life, and, but it does also that doesn't mean that I can live it in disrespect for my life. We talked about that earlier. But what's important is that we recognize that we have to teach people how to love life, respect life, defend life, that my life must be protected by the culture, protected by society, 
protected by government. No one has the right to take my life. No one has the right to overstep my, my life. And we have to teach people how to serve life. So you gotta think about that. And that means that my brothers and sisters who are listening in this, to this interview, you have to be thinking about me. You don't even know me, but do you think about me? Do I think about you? That I have an obligation to you just as much as you have an obligation to me. And there are people around the world, billions of people, I don't know, but I have to think of them. My actions reflect my attitude toward my brother and my sister. And again, if we look at the teachings of the Holy Scripture, think about the parable of the Good Samaritan. Two passed a person lying in the ditch, even went to the point of crossing over to the other side, going out of their way to ignore their brother and sister. That is a violence against life. We cannot ignore our brothers and sisters. We don't have the right to close our eyes or be indifferent to our brothers and sisters. And we should not ignore the plight of our brothers and sisters, the suffering of our brothers and sisters. And we cannot ignore or be indifferent towards the child in the womb, to the elderly person, to the handicapped, to the poor, to the marginalized. Every human life is a gift. Today, the voice of God is clearly ringing in our ears. Where is your brother? Where is your son and daughter? Where is your father and mother? What have you done? Every person is a rightful creation of God. And whether it be your parents or your children, we really have no right to claim anyone's life. God Almighty is the only one who has the right to deal with life. Even if that life is difficult, even to the person who is an enemy, in quote. Who, what I mean by that is a person who maybe is living in contradiction to life. You know, the, the person who has no regard for life. Does that mean that I treat them differently? So give you an example. When I stand in front of an abortion facility and the person who believes that abortion is a right, like the radical feminist, and they're in your face and they're yelling at you, screaming at you, vilely speaking to you, cussing at you, does it give me the right to treat them disrespectfully? No, it does not. It does not. It's not an eye for an eye or a tooth for a tooth. Jesus says, love your enemy. That person might be an enemy in the moment, but that person is the same, is called just like me to eternal life. And I want for that individual conversion, renewal, amendment, reparation. I want that person to be with me in paradise, not me in paradise and a brother and sister left behind. No person should be left behind. And that's how I have to live my life. That is living life. That's living the freedom of life. That's living in gratitude for the life that God has given me and living every day with that gratitude. That is what life is. And the purpose of my life is not about me. It's about my, my living my life as God wishes it to be and giving my life freely in the service of my brother and my sister. use media a lot in evangelization. So I believe in the importance of Catholic radio, Catholic TV, Catholics using the new media. Can I encourage everyone to watch your home TV? I think it's a great vehicle of evangelization. And God bless all of you. Shalom World, God's own channel.